In this week's Pasha, Vayigash, it begins with the confrontation between Yehuda and Yosef over the fate of Binyamin, whether Binyamin should indeed be taken as a slave or not. And uh, the interesting thing is that at the end of last week's parasha of uh, Miketz, the brothers showed their willingness to be to all become slaves. In fact, what they said was um, they denied that they stole the cup, and then they said, "Meiritz Kanan, Asher Yematzaito Me'avadecha, the mate, the one with whom you find the goblet will die." And we will all be slaves to the master. And indeed, they find the, uh, they find the cup in Binyamin's bag. And Yosef says to them, they don't know, is Yosef yet? What do you think you're doing? And Yehuda replies, What can we say to you? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found, has discovered our sins. Behold, we will all be slaves to my master. All of us and Binyamin with whom the cup was found. Um, the, and Yosef said, uh, God forbid, I should do such a thing. The one who I found the, the cup, the one who stole the cup, Binyamin will be my slave. The rest of you, go back in peace to your father. And at this stage, Yehuda says, no way, um, you can't do that, you can't take him as a slave. It's a bewildering thing. The one, uh, he's prepared for them all to be slaves, but not for Benjamin to be a slave. Now, we understand uh, the, uh, the emotional background over here. The story is that Yehuda made a solemn promise to his father that he would bring Benjamin back and he would take care of him. If they're all in prison together, at least he can take care of him. But he can't go back without Benjamin. But what argument is he presenting to Yosef? This is a very strange thing that he's saying to Yosef, um, you, have to, you have to let Benjamin go or take all of us as slaves. What's, what's the point of his argument over here? So what the Midrash says on this um, is Rebbe Simon says in um, Bereshit Rabbah chapter 93, uh, section 6, is that Rabbi Simon says it is written in our laws that if somebody steals and does not have enough money or assets to pay back the value of what he stole, then he is sold as a slave. But this young man, Binyamin, does have enough money to pay back and therefore he should not be sold as a slave. So Yehuda is saying that the, uh, that, that the Torah tells us you only sell somebody as a slave for theft when they can't pay it back. But Yamin can pay it back. Now, this also is, uh, is, is confusing because why would the viceroy of Egypt care what it says in the Jewish Torah? What, why, is, why, is he, why is he coming with that, with that approach? What's his sales pitch? So there are two approaches that I would like to take to answer this question. One from the Maggid of Dubna and one... Um, I've extracted and modified slightly from Rabbi Tzadok Coin of Lublin. He's speaking on a different point, but from his point you can, uh, you can get an answer. So firstly, from Rabbi Tzadok Coin of Lublin is that he says, why were the brothers so willing to accept it? Because he says, when it was all ten of them, and this was the Egyptian law that the entire company is sold into slavery, when this was decreed, they accepted it, because he saw this as punishment from Hashem for their sale of Yosef. And he said, Hashem is right. We are wrong. God has discovered that we have sinned, right, so to speak. God is taking payment for our misdeeds. And indeed, it is only just that we serve descendants. But once Yosef says, nah, I don't have to take all of you, only Benjamin, then he knew that there's something else going on here. This is not justice. This is not coming from Hashem and it needs to be fought. Very interesting idea is that when you can see that something is coming as a payment from Hashem for what you've done wrong, don't fight against it, accept that this is your sentence. But when it doesn't fit into something that's been done wrong, then you have to challenge and struggle against it. But what it comes out from the Rabbi Tzadok coin is that he's saying, originally the brothers proposed the Egyptian law that all ten of them would be taken. You're safe saying, no, only the one. 
Why? Obviously, he's willing to embrace the Jewish legal system. So that, Yehuda says, you can't pick and choose. You can't say, I'm going to follow the Jewish legal system and only take Benjamin. Because if you're following the Jewish legal system, you only take Benjamin if he can't pay. But here, Benjamin, in fact, can pay. Imagid of Dubna has a very different approach, which is uh, very sweet, is that he says that, uh, I don't mean sweet like cute, I mean sweet like uh, tasty, is that he says the, the whole idea that the Torah says that if somebody steals their sold as a slave, needs investigation. Because why would anybody want to purchase as a slave, as a servant in their home, someone who is a hardened criminal and a thief? <laughs> you, give, you, you lock your doors to keep out the thieves. You don't bring them into your home. So he says, well, that's why the Torah has this proviso. If a person is desperate and has nothing and is stealing only to survive, so much so that when they are found with something that they've stolen, they, they, they do not even have any assets to pay it back. Such a person, we need to give them a chance. They need rehabilitation. They need an opportunity. Bring them into your home. Give them a job. Assist them. Allow, allow them to live with you. We'll, we'll help them out. If a person does have enough to pay and he's still stealing, then he's a hardened criminal. Then why would you want him in your home? And that's the point that Yehuda, according to the Maggid of Dubna, that the Yehuda is saying to Yosef, he's saying, I don't understand. You want this guy, Benjamin, as a slave in your home, but he has enough money to pay for it. He didn't steal the goblet because he needs it to eat. He didn't steal the goblet because he's desperate. What appears before you is a hardened criminal, and you want him as a slave working in your home. It doesn't make any sense. Rather take me who you know was not to blame, who you know is an honest person. If what you want is a slave, take the honest person, not the dishonest person, which is, a, which is a great approach. Now, in both ways, both ways of understanding it, whether you say that Yosef himself was embracing the Jewish legal system, or whether it's that there is a point of logic behind it, which is, uh, which is very compelling, either way, where is it alluded to in the Torah that he is uh, that he's even saying this. Where in the Torah do we see that Yehuda is is mentioning this Jewish halacha? So the one of the commentaries on the midrash, the Maharzu, says as follows: Yehuda says to Yosef, "Be adoni, please, master. Yadaberna avadecha davar beoznei adoni. Let your servant say a matter in the ears of my master. Listen to what I have to say." So he could have said, Let me speak. Let me speak to you and listen. What does he say? Let me speak a davar. Let me speak a matter to you. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but when you talk about uh, you want to share some Torah, you say, give a davar Torah. And some people, when they are into abbreviations, they say, will you give a davar? Will you give a davar? Will you give a vort? So that the Marzu says is what's happening over here. You heard it saying to yourself, let me tell you a davar. Let me tell you a davar Torah. Let me tell you a vort. Right? And what's the vort? The vort is that since he hasn't, uh, since he has enough money to pay, he shouldn't be sold as a slave. So what we see over here is that hidden within the Torah, within that seemingly extra word davar, is an allusion to the davar Torah, that only a slave who does not have enough to pay, only a thief who does not have enough to pay should be sold as a slave. How is that relevant? Well, there's two approaches. One is Rabbi Tzadok Cohen who's saying, once he's turned down the Egyptian legal system and embraced the Jewish legal system, he has to embrace it in its entirety. Or you have the Maggot of Dubno who says that since, he, uh, since the point is to rehabilitate somebody who steals up desperation, it makes no sense to do it when somebody does have enough money to pay. One other point from Rabbi Tzadok Cohen, which is a very interesting one, is that when Yehuda, as part of his speech as well, says that... Um, when you asked us if we have brothers and a father and everything, so we told you that um, we have an old father, and he has a small son of his old age, and the brother, his brother is dead, referring to Yosef. Yosef's dead. Why would he think that Yosef's dead? Uh, why would he say that Yosef's dead? According to the Midrash, one of the reasons they're coming down is to try to find Yosef. Why is he saying he's dead? So Rashi says, well, he was scared that the Viceroy would now demand Yosef as well. And so therefore he said he's dead. But Rabbi Tzadok HaKoyen says something else. He says that now that they're looking back on the situation, they remember that there was a decree 
that Abraham's descendants would go into exile. And they thought that Yosef was the man who was fulfilling the decree. They didn't realize it would be all of them. They thought this decree would be fulfilled through Yosef. Now what they see is that it looks like that decree will be fulfilled through Binyamin. And the conclusion from this is that Binyamin is that Yosef obviously is dead if it can only be fulfilled through Benjamin. And so to that, Yehuda says, rather let it be fulfilled through me. Let I be the one who has to endure exile and slavery, not my brother Benjamin. And when Yosef hears that, he is overcome with emotion, the brothers reunite, and uh, I won't say it, uh, they live happily ever after, but certainly happier. Have a wonderful Shabbat.